Hi, this is Christopher Ray, and welcome to the first of three video lectures about Wang Anyi's novel, The Song of Everlasting Sorrow. I recommend that you also check out the brief video lecture that I made about Wang Anyi's life and works. In this video lecture, I just want to focus on part one of this epic three-part novel. This is a novel set during three distinct periods in China's modern history, and it follows this very common, typical girl. And I think this is a novel that begs the question, why Wang Qiao? Why a whole novel centered around this rather unremarkable character? Is this a character who has power over a city or over a country, much less over our attention? In this video lecture, I want to do two things. I want to look first at how Wang Anyi brings us into the city of Shanghai, representing it through a few key tropes. Second, I want to look at the figure of Wang Qiao, whose story we follow throughout all three parts of this novel. She is represented as something of a typical Shanghai girl, but she is plucked from the masses to be this minor celebrity. And then she has this long period after her heyday in which she leads a rather unextraordinary life. But the author tells the story of this rather unremarkable girl through a series of different cultural references and intertexts. The main intertext is the one that we find in the title. This is the Song of Everlasting Sorrow, which refers to Bai Jui's poem of the same title. So why attach the story of this unremarkable girl to a remarkable poem? The Song of Everlasting Sorrow is universally claimed to be Wang Anyi's masterpiece. This is an award-winning book. It has been a bestseller since it was first published in 1995 and has been expertly translated into English. It has also been adapted for stage, for television, and into a movie. Part one of the novel is set in the late 1940s. Japan had just been defeated by the Allied forces and was expelled from China. This was also a period of renewed civil war between the communists and the nationalists, which resulted in a communist victory in 1949. During this time of the late 1940s, there was tremendous civil unrest. China was essentially in ruins, a lot of infrastructure was disrupted. In popular culture, one of the things that happened was there was this huge turn towards ephemeral pleasures, towards pulp fiction, towards escapist fantasy. With prices rising so quickly, instant gratification was the name of the day. At the same time, so much was up in the air, there was a lot of grasping behavior and people competing for resources, competing for property, either to take and flee or to grab onto and hold onto. Besides war, one of the key contexts for this novel is the hyperinflation of the 1940s, which was most acute in 1948 and 1949, but saw prices rising from morning to night. So if you want to buy a dress, if you want to buy food, if you want to buy anything, you better buy it now. So this work of historical fiction weaves in the big story about what was going on in China and across the city of Shanghai, and the more granular story of Wang Qiao as an individual, as well as the friends and other acquaintances within her circle. So these would be some of the major plot events that occur in part one. The city of Shanghai is a place that captures the imagination, kind of like the city of New York, as a unique place of cultural ferment of mixing of all types of people, and one with its own remarkable history. Shanghai is also a city with a very ambivalent or mixed reputation, one that is a figure of nostalgia for many people, it is a place of aspiration, a place to go and make it big, but it is also a place of vice, of grinding poverty, and of cruelty and deprivation. In short, Shanghai is a place onto which people have projected many fantasies and about which they have told many stories. Let's focus on how the stories of Shanghai are told in this particular novel, and just focusing on chapter one, which is divided into these sections. We'll look at them one by one. Taking all of these different sections of chapter one together, I think that they add up to something of a prelude about Shanghai sources of vitality in showing us the spaces and the never ending movement between those spaces that give the city its life. This is a city that is constantly on the move, but it is not just people and things that move through the city and its spaces. It is also intangible things like gossip. We begin with a bird's eye view of Shanghai. We are looking down on the row houses and the alleyways. And eventually our narrator brings us down to the street level to take us inside some of these places. The Longtong are the alleyways through which people and gossip flow. And the Shurkuman are the houses in which much of the story takes place. And in these houses, you would often have multiple families, unless the family was particularly rich and did not have to subdivide it and sublet it to other people. If you're interested to learn more about the architectural history and the human history of the city, I would highly recommend this study by the historian Han Cha Lu, who takes us into these places, who talks about how the buildings were built, who talks about who lived in them and how much things cost. You can access architectural history and sociological or economic history through multiple historical sources. 
But I think what Wainey is trying to do in fictional terms is to create Shanghai as an imaginative space through defining things like gossip. This is a gossip that you can see. This is a gossip that you can feel, not just here. It is one that has its own logic, its own life force, and flows through this place in an almost magical way. Gossip is an intangible thing, but it is represented here as almost a sentient being, something that has its own life force, something that even has feelings. Wangani represents Shanghai as being defined by sense, and also by the blurring of senses through the technique of synesthesia. Gossip is something that we should hear, but we see it, we feel it, and we even smell it. And the original term in Wangani's novel, which is translated as gossip, is liu yan. Liu Yan was the title of an essay collection by Eileen Zhang from 1944, as well as the title of one essay in that collection. Liu Yan could also be translated as written on water or as flowing words. So there's an aquatic, fluid motif here. Liu Yan is also a term with poetic connotations, and it's one that writers like the poet Su Shi, as well as Eileen Zhang herself, have used to talk about writing itself as being a very ephemeral act, that these words will not last. Wangani also takes us into a gendered private space called the young lady's bedchamber. Sounds travel in and out of this bedchamber. People wonder about what's going on inside, who inhabits this space. And I would note that this is kind of the beginning in this novel of Wangani moving us back and forth between public and private spaces. This back and forth movement between public and private gendered spaces is not one that Wangani herself invented. If you look at period films like Long Live the Misses from 1947, we also have moving in and out of home life. We even have a love nest in this film. Love Everlasting would be another film from earlier that year that takes us into the private room rented by a young professional woman. The screenwriter for both of these films was Eileen Zhang, Zhang Eileen. When I discussed Chen Zhongshu's novel Fortress Besieged, I talked about his dialectic of human, beast, and ghost. Wang Ani's beasts are birds, pigeons. Pigeons are the lowliest of birds. City dwellers don't give them a second thought, although they may see them or hear them everywhere. But Wangani describes them as being the spirit of the city. They are witnesses, albeit mute witnesses, to the things that go on. Yet even though they themselves do not speak, they're represented as carrying the gossip of the city. They are witnesses to and keepers of the city's secrets. And therefore, they are emblems of the city's mystery. Pigeons are not the only birds mentioned in the novel. We also have sparrows, which are disparaged. They are compared unfavorably to the noble pigeon. And I would just note that this is a contrast to the 1949 film Crows and Sparrows, in which we have a Guomindang or nationalist officer as the predatory crow, and we have a band of humble sparrows who band together and drive the crow off. So you can get a sense just from the opening chapter what an innovative author we're dealing with here, who is not starting with character, who is also not just starting with scenic description, but who is weaving together all of these different strands of the imagination to define the place. And then when it comes to introducing the main character, it's a main character who is also introduced in a very atypical fashion as being something of a split, you know, almost pigeon-like herself. There are many, many different Wang Xiaos running around the city. I would not claim that Wang Xiao represents Shanghai in total because her character is inflected in very particular ways. I would say that she is associated with places of urban consumption, certain institutions, or rich households, for example. Photography is particularly important in her story. Women became newly visible in a significant way in the late Qing Dynasty. So this is 50 years before the 1940s, which is Wang Xiao's heyday. You have average women being represented doing new things in print and popular culture. You even have the Empress Dowager herself, right, the seat of imperial power, posing for photographs which are then distributed to the general public as postcards or in the newspaper. One of the ways that late Qing newspapers boosted their subscription was to have contests where readers would write in to nominate who should be the queen of the flowers, the top courtesan in Shanghai. And all of the different patrons would write in and debate with each other. And of course, photographs of all of the contestants have to be printed in the newspaper. So people subscribe to the newspaper and get caught up in all the hype. For better or for worse, photographic technology propelled the modernization of gender roles in China during this period. So you have women being represented doing new things, of newly independent, riding a motorcycle by herself. But this type of exposure and representation was very much a double-edged sword, in which you could just turn women to flat objects of consumption for a new type of exploitation. And of course, major corporate interests were very quick to use images of attractive women to sell products like cigarettes or soap. Wang Xiao does not become a movie star. She fails her screen test. But as something of a consolation prize, she does get to sit for a photo shoot. And one of these photos becomes key to her celebrity as a Miss Shanghai. 
I showed a collage of images from the 1935 film New Women because in the plot of that film, we also have a woman whose photograph becomes key to her celebrity in Shanghai, but that celebrity proves to be her undoing. In the film, the woman in question is an aspiring novelist, but the publisher only agrees to publish her novel if he can use her photograph to market it. Stanley Kwan kind of links together Wang Ani, Zhang Ailing, and Ran Ning Yu because he has adapted works by both Zhang Ailing and Wang Ani, and he also directed a biopic of Ran Ning Yu called Center Stage. Image is particularly important in how Wang Chia becomes a celebrity, but she becomes a celebrity because her image is very different from all of these flashy Shanghai beauties. To me, the way that Wang Chia is described both by the narrator and by characters in the novel is quite interesting. For me, it calls to mind an essay that Eileen Chong wrote about her own writing called Writing of One's Own, in which she refers to her ideal as being one of uneven contrast, which she's not really going for flashy color. She's not going for crimson and jade. She's not going for a strong contrast between good and evil. She's going for something much more muted. And to me, that is very much how Wang Qiao is represented. She is not Miss First Place. She is Miss Third Place. This is a novel that builds much of its richness through its intertexts. It refers to many different cultural allusions, to poems, to popular music, to architecture, to song. And I want to focus on just one for right now, the one that appears in its title. The discussion of gossip links gossip to pain, but then it immediately distinguishes between that type of pain and the type of pain suffered by the Tang Emperor, or the king of Chu. This is not a grand and heroic suffering. This is like pebbles and dirt, the tentacles of ivy creeping stealthily out of bounds. That is the novel's first mention of this epic poem by the Tang poet Bai Juyi. This is a long ballad ostensibly about one emperor and his beloved consort, which also alludes to another pair, and it came to symbolize the figure of the femme fatale, the Qingcheng and Qingguo. One glance was enough to topple a city, a second glance would topple the kingdom. Such was the power of her beauty. Eileen Chang uses this motif in the title of her famous story, Qingcheng Zhi Lian. In this story, we have a romance between a young woman and a young man, first in Shanghai and later in Hong Kong. And while they're in Hong Kong, the Japanese invade and the city falls. And it is actually the Japanese invasion that brings them together as a married couple. Qingcheng Zhi Lian is usually translated as love in a fallen city, the fallen city referring to Hong Kong. It could also be translated as love to topple a city, although actually the causality in the story is precisely the reverse of that. It is the fall of the city which brings about the marriage. The title, however, could also be translated as love of a femme fatale, but this would be a very, very ironic translation, since the woman in the story, again, is rather unremarkable. At one point in the novel, Wang Ani's narrator tells us very explicitly and directly that Wang Qiyao is not a woman to topple a city or an empire. So isn't that just end of story? She's not. The answer, of course, is that Wang Ani is still defining her heroine against this trope of the femme fatale. She's just saying that she is not the same, that she is defining Wang Qiao against type. So I think it's a good question to ask of how does Wang Ani modify this trope of the femme fatale, a trope that she invokes in the text of the work as well as in its very title. My answer would be that Wang Ani is creating a new type of icon, one that is no less abstract than the femme fatale. This would be the femme ordinaire, if you wanted to use a similar term. An ordinary woman, an understated woman, a modest or unremarkable woman, an every woman, so to speak. But here is the key difference. Wyany is not defining this ordinary woman or telling the story of her life in an ordinary, realistic, unremarkable mode. Wang Qiao is an individual, but she's also a femme ordinaire. She's a type. She is representative of different things, like the typical Shanghai girl, as we've already been told. We could ask questions about what Wang Qiao represents in relation to the city of Shanghai, or urban culture more generally, or women, or even history. But part one of this novel conveys very clearly that Wang Qiao is a figure onto which many people within the story world project their desires. And so that puts us as readers in an interesting position. What desires or thoughts or meanings do we want to project onto Wang Qiao? But in attributing meanings to Wang Qiao and building stories around her, what types of self-deception might we fall prey to? After all, fantasies can be connected to not just consummate beauty, not just to grand histories, but even to humble things about the everyday.